Now we'll move on to the final speaker of the session, Dr. Gary Patton. Gary is a Michael and Tana Powell professor at Washington University, where he holds appointments in the departments of chemistry and medicine. Gary is also the director of the Center for Metabolomics and Isotope Tracing and the co-director of the Metabolic Kinetics Core in the Nutrition Obesity Research Center. Today, he will present on big data from heavy molecules. Take it away, Gary. Thank you, Andrew. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're perfect. Thank perfect. you. Thank you. Well, first, I just want to thank CIL for hosting this event. It's been something I know that's been in, in the works for quite some time, and it's, uh, it was a thrill to see it come together with such a, a stellar lineup of speakers and a lot of outstanding lectures today. I've, I've enjoyed participating, and I'm, I'm thrilled to uh, have the opportunity to close it out here today. What I'm going to be talking about is using stable isotopes in the context of metabolomics. So the big data that my title is referring to is metabolomics. And I wanted to start with this slide. <clears throat> I've got a lot of other isotopes on here. It's sort of an ode to the isotopes that didn't get mentioned today. The last time we did isotope day, someone pointed out that a lot of what we focused on was C13. And there were a lot of other isotopes that were played important roles historically in biological research, and so I've, I've just included some of those uh, shown here. And what I'm gonna do today is discuss stable isotopes and their role in metabolomics in really two very different applications. The first application is going to focus on data reduction. So the, the diagram that I have behind these two points is a, a visualization of metabolomics data and the complexity and ways in which it can be annotated. So I'm gonna be talking about using stable isotopes to try to accomplish some of that annotation. And then the second part of the talk is going to be a biological application in which we use stable isotopes to track how tissues inside of a, an animal or an organism talk to one another, how they exchange metabolites. So starting with the, the first part of the talk here, the data reduction, I'd like to, to, to begin by highlighting the significance of why data reduction is really imperative when you're performing untargeted metabolomics. And I'll do that by mentioning and describing a series of experiments that were performed over a decade now that represent the, the really the complexity of untargeted metabolomics data and why the, the results can be challenging to interpret. So this was an experiment that was done on E. coli and when you take, when we took E. coli and we extracted the metabolites from these cells and we analyzed them by liquid chromatography mass spectrometry or LCMS. In this particular experiment, we saw 25,342 different signals peaks, sometimes in metabolomics, those are referred to as features. And it's pretty typical when you perform metabolomics with LCMS to see this number of features, tens of thousands of unique peaks. Now, despite the fact that we saw that number of, of signals, the number of signals that we could identify was strikingly small. So if we looked at the, the total number of signals that, that we were measuring compared to those that, that we could identify, it was a, a very small proportion. And so in 2010, I would have told you that this was very exciting. And I would have showed you this comprehensive map of cellular metabolism, which we've seen a couple of days, a couple of times already today. And I would have said that, although this is a, a picture of everything that is supposedly known about metabolism, that the metabolomics data and all of those peaks that we can't identify suggests that there are a lot of other metabolites that we're measuring that haven't yet been characterized with respect to structures, pathways, and biology. And I used to draw this slide uh, showing here a bunch of black pathways representing those unknown molecules at unknown space. However, over the last 10 years or so, my perspective on this has really evolved. And in the longer version of this talk, I include some anecdotes where I detail some of these unknown molecules or signals that we chase graduate students and postdocs spending months or years of time on and why we got tricked into pursuing them thinking that they, thinking that they were exciting, but how most of them did not end up panning out. And so the question is why? Um, why has my perspective evolved and why are some of these anecdotes that I could share with you where we thought we had found unknowns, things that we couldn't identify, 
uh, why did they end up not being exciting after all? And one of the, the critical points to this assessment is that a lot of the signals or peaks features that you detect in untargeted metabolomics are not associated with biological compounds. And so what I'd like to do here in the next couple of minutes is describe an approach that we've taken to try to understand which signals in a metabolomics data set are derived from the biological samples and which are not. In the context of E. coli, the way that we approached this question was relatively simple. We took E. coli cells and we cultured them in unlabeled media. So that is all of the carbons were unlabeled in the media represented here as C12. Or we took the same exact cells and we cultured them in parallel in media in which all of the carbon was labeled represented here as C13. We then take an equal aliquot out of each of the, the vials. We mix them, extract them and perform liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And then we inspect the, the LCMS data. The logic behind this experimental design is that metabolites contain carbon. And so real metabolites that are derived from the E. coli ought to show up as two, two different versions. We ought to see a version of the metabolite that's made in the unlabeled cells, which will contain C12. And we ought to see a version of that same metabolite made in the, the heavy cells where it incorporates C13. So we systematically look at every signal in the data set, and we ask if that signal has a corresponding dance partner whose apex is in the green box shown here. How do we set the boundary conditions of that green box? Well, the X dimension of that green box is set based on the mass, the charge ratio. So you can see here the peak on the left has an M over Z of 179. So that means that it can't have 50 carbons, for example. And the Y dimension of that box is set on the basis that we mix these samples at a one-to-one -one ratio. So they ought to be present at approximately the same, the same intensity. If the signal shows up in both, uh, if it passes this filter, we say it's credentialed and meaning that it is derived from the biological cells, in this case, E. coli. Now, initially we did this in E. coli, thinking that, that any lab could, could repeat this. Um, but as it turns out, there are a lot of analytical labs uh, that don't, uh, don't want to mess around with cells. And so we are very excited that Cambridge Isotopes <clears throat> decided to develop this as a product. Um, these credentialed E. coli uh, kits, which you can find on, on their website, and Andrew mentioned them earlier. And in addition to uh, enabling researchers not to have to grow the cells themselves, it also adds some benefits because these are stable, they use the same protocol, uh, there's rigorous quality control, um, so there's reproducibility and it adds a lot of rigor to the experiments. So if we then think about the, the, the metabolomics data set, we end up with these samples that these signals that can be biological or non-biological in origin. Um, and the non-biological peaks can be of two varieties. They can be artifacts or contaminants. And uh, I do recognize those as being different. Contaminants you can think of as being real chemicals that aren't derived from your samples. Artifacts you can think of as being man-made, things like electronic noise or perhaps informatic mistakes. The biological signals also come in a couple different varieties. There are those that are redundant and those that are unique. The redundant signals arise because one metabolite can show up more than once in the data for reasons that are listed here. Adducts, naturally occurring isotopes, oligomers, the metabolite can break into fragments when it enters the mass spectrometer. As it turns out, the credentialing technology is very useful for annotating some of these other categories of molecules, some of these redundancies shown here. But due to time constraints, I won't have time to, to go through that today. And then for the unique compounds, we have those that are known and those that are novel. So these are the types of molecules that I discussed on the previous slide that would be um, those that aren't showing up in metabolomics databases. Now, if we think about the relative distribution of these different categories of molecules in our E. coli sample, this represents a histogram. So you can see that the number of molecules, the number of peaks, I should say, that actually correspond to unique biological molecules is strikingly small relative to the total. So if we then go to what I would argue is our picture of E. coli from our data set in 2021, it looks something like this, where we're still detecting tens of thousands of different signals, but the, the number of those signals that are associated with unique biological compounds is relatively small compared to those that 
are associated with non-biological signals and those that are redundant. So that's our, a, an example of how we can use stable isotopes to achieve data annotation and lead to data reduction. But what I'd li now like to do is talk about using stable isotopes in a different context, and that is using stable isotopes to track metabolite exchange in an organism. And so what I mean by metabolite exchange is that in an organism, in an animal, you have different tissues, and those tissues are inputting and outputting metabolites. So they're taking up nutrients and they're outputting uh, metabolite byproducts. But every tissue is doing that, and these tissues can, of course, interact. And these interactions between tissues are incredibly important to metabolic physiology. So the question is, can we use stable isotopes to try to understand this metabolic physiology and track how the tissues are communicating with one another? So the way that we approach, one way in which we approach uh, doing metabolite exchange in my lab is by using uh, the zebrafish model. Now you can do metabolite exchange in other models. Uh, you can certainly think about these questions in the context of mouse, uh, human patients or other types of models, but what I'm going to focus on today is zebrafish. So if you haven't seen a zebrafish before, this is a, a picture of a, of a zebrafish. They're just a couple of centimeters um, in length. And in my lab, we're very interested in cancer. And so we use a zebrafish melanoma model. Um, and this is pictured here on the bottom. So this is a zebrafish that's P53 null, and it has a BRAF B600E mutation in its melanocytes. And this spontaneously gives rise to, to melanoma tumors. And you can see one of those depicted here. These tumors actually get quite large in the animal. They can end up representing a few percent of the animal's overall mass and can be several times larger than other major organs in the animal like the liver. I'll say more about that in just a couple of minutes. The tumors in the zebrafish behave a lot like the tumors they mimic the, the tumors that we see in human patients. And so if you think about a tumor in a, a human patient, one of the characterizing attributes is that it has a very high avidity for glucose. This is a phenomenon known as the Warburg effect. And it's exploited clinically uh, by using PET imaging, 2DG imaging. So what I'm showing you here on the left is an image from a human patient um, who was given fluorodeoxyglucose. And because deoxyglucose is taken up just like glucose, and here it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hot, so when you do the, this is for the PET scan. And you can see this is actually a patient that had a melanoma and it metastasized and all these bright spots represent tumors, uh, metastatic tumors. So we've got tumors in the nasal uh, fossa there, we've got them in the uh, peritoneal cavity in the lungs, the vertebrae, um, those are all those spots. Again, representing high glucose uptake. And we see the same phenomena in the zebrafish tumors. So this is a, a diagram representing the relative uptake of deoxyglucose. Here we didn't use fluorodeoxyglucose, it's just regular deoxyglucose quantified by LCMS. And this is the amount of glucose that's taken up here by the tumor compared to these other tissues. And you can see that the amount of glucose is similarly high compared to the, the other healthy tissues in the animal. So one interesting question in this context is whether or not all, taking up all of this glucose could alter the physiology of the animal. As I said, these tumors in the zebrafish get rather large, and this ends up being a, a relatively significant glucose sink. So it's taking up a lot of glucose, and I think everyone appreciates that glucose levels are carefully regulated in the blood. You know, they can't be too high, they can't be too low. And so we were interested in whether or not these tumors taking up all of this glucose might actually alter and disrupt glucose homeostasis in the animal. But what we found was when we tried to quantify glucose levels in the blood of these animals, this is in the serum of the zebrafish, you could see whether the zebrafish were wild type or whether they had large melanoma tumors here represented as BRAF P53, glucose levels were, were kept constant. So everything was working as it should and that B, the glucose levels were maintained. And so we are interested in how this might be accomplished? How was it that glucose levels were being, um, were being kept consistent? And we surmised that, that metabolite exchange might be part of the equation. So to study this, we have to isotopically label the zebrafish. And zebrafish are very convenient in this regard relative to, say, other animals. Like you, you just heard 
um, from John hearing about the, the mice. Um, zebrafish are, are easier in that um, we don't have to do any infusions. We don't have to uh, stabilize the animal. We don't have to, sorry, excuse me, constrain the animal to administer. Um, you just simply sprinkle the, the isotope in the water um, and the isotope is consumed by the animals either through diffusion or it's, uh, by, it's through drinking. Um, and as you can see, um, now shown here on the left, if we measure the amount of glucose that's labeled in the serum of these animals, over time, glucose levels go up, so we get an increasing amount of label. But after about 12 hours, we reach what is known as isotopic steady state. It turns out that being at isotopic steady state is convenient when you're doing these kinds of flux or isotope tracer measurements. So this is a good measurement to have. Now, one way in which we can analyze the zebrafish once we've labeled them is we can use LCMS, just like I've outlined on the, on the previous slides with, with respect to E. coli. But an alternative way in which we can analyze the zebrafish is by using metabolomics imaging, mass spectrometry-based imaging. So what I'm showing you here is a zebrafish cross-section that's been deposited on effectively what is a microscope slide. And what we can do is we can use a desorption beam to come in and, and hit the zebrafish tissue. And that causes the metabolites to go into the gas phase where they can subsequently be detected by a mass spectrometer. There's several ways that you can, you can do this, several ways to create desorption beams, several ways to do these imaging experiments. Uh, the data I'm gonna show you today is from DESI or desorption electrospray ionization. We're also doing some other moldy based experiments um, as well. And then what you could do of course is you can look at not only at labeled metabolites, but you can also look at unlabeled metabolites in addition. So we can localize where the, the labeled metabolites are and the unlabeled metabolites are within the animals. And I'll also say that, that we're not the first ones to, to do these uh, zebrafish uh, imaging experiments. Um, uh, David Moneyman, who spoke earlier today, uh, published a, a paper uh, a couple months ago, a really nice paper showing doing some of these zebrafish images as well. Uh, these are some of the images that we've generated. So this, these are just some, some uh, smattering of different kinds of metabolites that we can see. Um, you see phosphatidylserine, histidine, inosine, lactate, um, showing distribution patterns. And as I note, we can look at the unlabeled version of this as well as the labeled version to try to gain uh, some kind of assessment of how these tissues might be interacting metabolically with one another. So what I'd like to do now is, is tell you about the result of some, some of the, the interpretation, some of the results that we've got by doing these experiments. And this is really the result of using uniform C13 glucose, administering that to the zebrafish um, and, uh, and looking at that in the tumor animal. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all the labeling data and some of the calculations and the modeling that we've done, but I'll just give you a general perspective of what's, what's happening uh, in these animals. So if we look at what's going on in the tumor, um, the tumor takes up, as I've noted, takes up a lot of glucose. So it's taking up the uniform C13 labeled glucose and the glucose is being metabolized pretty much as you would expect. Um, it's being metabolized through glycolysis to produce pyruvate. Now, classically, we tend to think of that pyruvate in a, a cancer cell as being uh, transformed into lactate, um, being, and then being excreted from the cell. Um, but what we find in these tumors in the zebrafish, these melanoma tumors, is that while a lot of the pyruvate is in fact converted into lactate, a significant proportion of the, the pyruvate is also converted into alanine. And this is a little interesting because um, as I note, we, we tend to think of glucose being transformed into lactate, but to give you a sense of how, how rapid, how, what the, the flux, the extent of the flux by which this was happening in these tumors, I'm comparing the production of C13 alanine from glucose in the tumor and the muscle. We know that in muscle, uh, the muscle will take up glucose and transform it to alanine. You can see that the tumor uh, is doing that here by this labeling, is doing that even more extensively than the muscle. And I should note that that requires that they, they take up a nitrogen. So the pyruvate ends up picking up a nitrogen to produce alanine. We then find that that alanine is reduced, uh, excuse me, released from the tumors, gets released into the blood, and it travels to the liver in these zebrafish where it is taken up and it is then transformed back into pyruvate. Now in so doing, the alanine loses its nitrogen and that nitrogen then is secreted from the animal as waste. Okay, so that's ammonium 
in, in the fish. And one of the convenient things about fish is that that just goes into the water. And so we can quantify the extent to which that nitrogen is being released into the water by measuring the water with mass spectrometry. And as it turns out, these animals, to indicate the increased flux by which this pathway that I've highlighted here is happening, if you look at the nitrogen excretion in animals that have tumors, it's increased by about twofold. And indeed, we can even trace in separate experiments, we can add N15 tracers, and we can trace the, the nitrogen from the tumor into the excretion. Um, so just to give you a sense of how that's happening. Gary, then, one minute yes. to go. Thank you. <clears throat> then once the pyruvate is, once the pyruvate is uh, in the liver, it gets uh, transformed back into glucose through gluconeogenesis. Um, and now glucose can be released into the blood and that glucose can go back to the tumor and feed the tumor. So this can help sustain, normally this, this process of gluconeogenesis, the liver acting in its gluconeogenic capacity is normally uh, a process that we would see in a fasting state um, to help maintain our glucose levels. But we see here that the tumor is exploiting this physiology um, to help maintain the, the glucose levels. Now it's interesting to think about where that nitrogen comes from. Uh, just to cut to the chase here, we did several experiments and we determined that that nitrogen is coming from branch chain amino acids. So the, the tumors are taking up branch chain amino acids. This is probably best reflected by enzyme called BCAT1 that's utilized in, in breaking down the branch chain amino acids. You can see that in the healthy melanocytes, BCAT1 is effectively off, um, but it's highly expressed in melanoma. And in collaboration with some oncologists, Ryan Fields, Chuck Kaufman, and, and uh, some others at WashU, we were able to get some melanoma tissues and see essentially the same pattern there. And so what ends up happening is that nitrogen comes from the branch chain amino acids. Uh, the nitrogen gets pulled off the, the branch chain amino acids, and then that carbon skeleton gets oxidized via the TCA cycle. Now, the last slide that I have uh, here today is whether or not knowing this cycle, is this anything that we can exploit therapeutically? For example, knowing that the pyruvate is converted to alanine, can we, can we block that alanine amino transferase and might that have some therapeutic effect? Um, and I'll just leave you with today by saying that, that indeed that does work. Um, so if you, if you give uh, animals that have melanoma uh, Alt-I, which is the, the drug that we use to block that alanine amino transferase for 10 days, you can see that we get a reduction in the, the, the melanoma tumors by about twofold. Um, so with that, uh, I'll wrap up. I'll thank the, the people in my uh, group who did these experiments. I just want to point out uh, the, the key people here, Fuad Nasser and Maddie Jackstat, who spearheaded the zebrafish work that I showed you. Um, and um, uh, Nathaniel Mayhew and uh, Kevin Cho, who spearheaded the E. coli and the credentialing work that I showed you. And with that, I'll, I'll thank you and, and conclude. Thank you, Gary. That was an excellent talk, as always. We're a little short on time, but I will read out these two questions from the audience. The first one states, when we compare the 12C and 13C E. coli data, is it correct to say that we assume biological molecules are all turning over during the experiment? For example, if there is slow turnover, there will be very little labeling and give impression that the analyte is non-biological? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, and it actually highlights one of the conveniences to using E. coli. So in E. coli, you can do these experiments where you start with a very small number of cells um, and then grow the cells up. So the cells turn over many, many times. Um, so, so although in theory, uh, maybe a cell won't assimilate label, if it's in some quiescent state, um, we grow the E. coli cells, we start with a very small number of cells and we let them turn over uh, many, many times. So we end up with millions of cells um, that we evaluate. Now we have repeated these kinds of experiments uh, in other animals and other organisms, other cell types. Um, and if you try to do that and say something like a mouse, um, you start to run into the problems that were mentioned. But with E. coli, uh, it, it proves to be less of a problem. Excellent. One final question starts with a comment. Great talk, Gary. The question is, wondering how your statistical approach has changed with the knowledge of the credentialing. Oh, yeah, that's, um, that's, a, that's a juicy one. Um, so um, statistical approaches, I think, um, you know, exactly, I get, there's a lot of statistics in a lot of different places. Um, and so it kind of depends on what exactly we're talking about. There's statistics of fold changes, there's statistics of, um, of, you know, there's false discovery rates, um, there's confidence levels. So there's a lot of places to do statistics. So um, I'll, I'll, it's kind of hard to know exactly what, I, I, don't, I can't talk about all those areas, but I will say that, that, that 
in terms of statistics of fold changes, um, maybe that's what the, the person was referring to. Um, so we often think of, you know, you've got features and you want to know, okay, this feature is changing threefold or twofold or whatever it might be. Um, and actually, in using credentialing, we found that a lot of artifacts are, are contaminants are um, contributing to those fold changes um, and those patterns, you know, those quote unquote systems biology patterns that you might see at the whole data level. Um, and we think it's really important um, if you're going to do quote unquote systems biology on the entire data set that you really remove you know, the 90 plus percent of stuff uh, signals that aren't associated with real biological compounds because otherwise what you're mapping um, onto pathways or what you're trying to say, you know, this disease causes this amount of metabolic perturbation. It's not really very fruitful. It's not very correlative with what's actually happening. It's more a function of what pipette tips you use. I hope that answered the question to at least some extent. That's great, Gary. Right, that concludes our session. Thanks again to all speakers.